Hi, and good evening, everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Callie McCune, and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Indiana Historical Society. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Building Community, LGBTQ Spaces in Indianapolis. We're really excited to bring you this presentation tonight in partnership with AIA Indiana, Indiana and um, the Indianapolis Historic Preservation Commission. At the Indiana Historical Society, we aim to be Indiana storyteller, connecting people to the past. We do this by collecting millions upon millions of pieces of paper, based materials, whether that's books, paintings, letters, photographs, diaries, maps, and then finding interesting, exciting, and intriguing ways to share that, whether that's through publications, exhibitions, or events like this. About five years ago, IHS took a look at our collections and realized that if we wanted to be Indiana storyteller, we needed to be able to reflect an inclusive story of our state. Starting from two foundational collections, we launched our LGBTQ collecting initiative, which includes to this day about 200 oral histories from across the state, as well as a plethora of documents that tell the story of legalizing marriage, newspapers documenting safe spaces, fundraisers about the AIDS crisis, and one of our newest additions that we're really excited about, the Indiana Youth Group Collection, which we just took in in early March, right as COVID shut things down. These documents, photographs, newspapers, legal documents, books, and so much more allow for us current and future historians to make sure that LGBTQ voices are represented in the work of historians and in our work that we do every day. Before I hand it over to Laura and get us started, I wanted to make sure I go over a couple pieces of Zoom logistics. For tonight's program, you'll hear from Jordan Ryan of the Indiana Historical Society and Meg Pernsley of the Indianapolis Historic Preservation Commission. Then we'll have a bit of time at the end for question and answer from both panelists. You're all muted for tonight's event, but we do wanna hear your thoughts and you can do that in two ways. Put your questions in the question and answer boxes in the question and answer section of the webinar. We'll collect those as we go along and you can see which ones, who's asked questions and tell us which questions you want answered. We'll do our best to answer those at the, as many as we can at the end of the program. And then if you have comments as we go along or more questions, you can also put those into the chat. We'll add links and resources as we go there. Um, and you'll also find a lot of those resources in an email from us tomorrow morning. And just so you know, we are currently recording this presentation. Um, it will be available on the IHS website, hopefully in the next week or two. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Laura and we'll get started. Thank you, Callie. Um, so I am the Indianapolis president of the American Institute of Architects. I know that not everyone on the phone call is an architect, so I just want to give a brief primer to what that means. Um, the AIA w was founded nationally in 1857. Um, the Indianapolis chapter is, itself is over 125 years old. And what we are is a nonprofit professional association um, that represents architects. Uh, so think of the Bar Association for Lawyers, that's us for architects. Um, and we work to uh, represent the interests and provide services to architects so that they can help um, live into their communities and design alongside um, all of the people in the various communities, which is very important as uh, this program will show. Um, we are able to do these things thanks to some wonderful sponsors and I want to give each of them a moment to say hi and um, talk about what they do. Um, Rod McComas, I believe you should be on and unmuted if you would like to say hello. Rod, I'm not seeing you in the uh, current list on. Are you, if you're under a different name, if you could drop that in the chat. Or raise your hand. <laughs> uh, while he is in that process, I see that Andrew Spawn is on. Andrew, would you like to give the Spawn hello? 
Sure. Um, hey, uh, we are uh, happy to work with AIA as, as much as we can. We're an architectural product company based in Indianapolis for the last 44 years. And uh, yeah, glad to be here. Glad to do whatever we can for the LGBTQ community. Great. Thank you. I do not see Randy Royer either. Um, let's see, Angie, I believe was planning to be on. I don't see Angie's name either, but. Someone has raised their hand, Bethany. Hi, Mary, you should be able to unmute yourself. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, and then, let's see, the last one was Sarah Phillips. <clears throat> okay. Well, as you can see, um, our our work occurs uh, thanks to wonderful sponsors, and as as happens every year, we have a variety of events that are um, collaborations with different groups throughout the city, with different groups across the nation. Um, sometimes open to the public, sometimes um, AI specific. Um, this year, we have taken a focus on equity as uh, the topic of this tonight's conversation shows. Um, other conversations on the docket will be about um, pipeline initiatives to the profession um, and how to engage with um, minority groups and other members within um, the K-12 education system, um, affordable housing. Uh, we've previously talked about um, issues related to uh, revitalizing the White River. Um, we've also spoken about uh, food deserts and the architecture of food education. So those are, those are some of the topics that you can expect to see um, that architects are engaged in um, actively trying to um, improve communities. Um, so as Callie mentioned, tonight we have two great speakers. Um, first we will hear from Jordan Ryan and then Meg Pernsley. Um, Jordan Ryan is the architectural archivist and coordinator for the Indianapolis Bicentennial Project for the Indiana Historic Su Historical Society and the Archives Library. Um, they have a master's degree in public history from IUPUI and a bachelor's degree in art history from Heron School of Art and Design. Their scholarship revolves around the urban built environment and development, the history of redlining, urban highway displacement, hostile architecture, and LGBTQ historic sites. They previously worked at Indiana Landmarks and DNR's Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology and serve on the boards of Historic Urban Neighborhoods of Indianapolis and Preserve Greater Indy. Meg Pernsley, um, before accepting her current position as IHPC Administrator in 2018, Meg was an architectural reviewer for 18 years with the IHPC serving as both senior and principal architectural reviewer during her tenure. Before she started with the city of Indianapolis in September of 2000, Meg worked for two years with the Illinois Main Street program as a Main Street designer. Meg received a Master of Fine Arts in Historic Preservation from the Savannah College of Art and Design and a Bachelor of Science in Interior Design from Southern Illinois University. Um, so those are the two wonderful people that we will be hearing from today. And I believe that the plan is for Jordan to start us off. Thanks. I'm gonna share my screen. How's that look, Laura? Looks great. Right. Cool, thanks. Um, so tonight I'm gonna talk about a few different local projects that really have to deal with um, the architecture and history of queer spaces in central Indiana. 
So a little background information. Uh, there's a lot of different acronyms and groups that sound the same. So just to give you sort of an outline, first was in 2013, Indiana Landmark started a historic building survey project, which was published in 2016. Um, a year later in 2014, the Indiana Historical Society kicked off their collecting initiative, which is much more archival based. And then in 2019, the Indianapolis Historic Preservation Commission um, took some of the materials and data and collections that were being processed. And that's what is informing the Preserve Indy Initiative, which Meg will discuss tonight. So a little background information about um, the landmark survey. It came from the National Park Service initiative to study, it was called the LGBTQ Heritage Initiative and landmarks was definitely in the forefront of this. Um, they had received a generous grant from CICF to start surveying properties and looking at um, things in the newspaper, things in archival materials and periodicals to sort of document spaces. Um, so I was one of the surveyors for the project and I spent a lot of time looking at sort of the background information, the questions that were being asked, the questions that weren't being asked, and sort of where did we stand as architectural historians and historic preservationists understanding this topic. Um, so just a little bit on this slide, I think it's important to acknowledge that we don't have a single or monolithic experience as LGBTQ persons. Um, we also have different factors that sort of show what our perspectives are as we experience space. And those are factors that are both class and cultural and racial, but also very important to acknowledge sort of the, the gender privilege and sexism that does exist in space because a lot of the places we reside in and interact with are designed by men for men. Um, so it was very, that was very relevant to me as I was sort of understanding how I fit in as a professional, as a historian with my own um, unique gender identity sort of status. So a little bit about the survey method. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty much casting a wide net, looking for different collections and materials at all sorts of local archives. Everyone's got a little bit of something um, really, really rich uh, collections throughout Indianapolis. And as we sort of went through the collections, we were identifying locational data, you know, checking these sites, seeing what was protected both on the National Register, but also locally protected through the Preservation Commission, um, looking at what had been demolished, what was altered, determining if things were eligible to be nominated. A lot of site visits and photography and sort of documenting spaces as we went. And then all of the sites were organized in uh, themes to sort of help create a narrative and to organize the data and, and sort of filter the data if we wanted to. So now I'm gonna take you through the different data sets. Um, so the first thing I wanna show you is just the summary of the data. It's 419 locations. So out of these 419, 28 are listed on the National Register of Historic Places, um, mostly in neighborhood nominations. Another 14% are eligible to be listed, and sadly, another 14% have already been demolished. Um, so this map really gives you a good sense of both the city sort of growing over time and looking at different um, commercial corridors, like you can see a really big cluster in the downtown area, and then you see like a northern spoke kind of in the Meridian Street to College Avenue area going up to Broad Ripple. You see two sort of strips going horizontally, the first on the south side being Washington Street and then up a little bit is 38th Street and then certainly there are spots sort of populating kind of around the 465 loop. Um, so thinking about access, commercial corridors, but also density, you know, where where are areas that are more dense in downtown and in the neighborhood sort of surrounding Center Township. You know, this map kind of makes sense um, when you think about all of those factors. So out of the themes, uh, the first theme was civil rights. And this uh, we defined as just locations that 
you know, protests and meetings and events that were, um, you know, for the purpose of extending, defending civil rights. That's where these sites had occurred. Um, so it's 51 locations out of the 429. So one example of this would be the city county building. You know, uh, it was a site of over 400 same-sex marriage licenses after the federal courts ruled that the state ban was unconstitutional. We remember those two and a half days where there was quite the rush um, to get marriage licenses before it was stayed for a bit. Um, so, you know, besides the city county building, which I know it's a very polarizing building, you either love it or you hate it, um, but besides its architectural merits, which some may believe in, some may not. I do think it also has this incredible historical significance that we should consider if we um, ever do list it on the National Register. The second theme was the arts, and this was defined as cultural institutions that, you know, things like theaters and cinemas, art galleries and fairs, and performance halls that supported the LGBTQ community. Um, much smaller numbers here, just 30 locations, but surprisingly, 53% are already listed on the National Register, um, which was an interesting fact. Uh, but one of which that was is not listed that I have a special place in my heart for is the Emerson Theater on East 10th Street, um, which if you're in your 30s or 40s, you might remember this being quite the music venue back in the day. Um, but before that, it was actually a a cinema that had uh, discount films that were LGBTQ interest. Another theme is health, uh, which we defined as organizations and clinics and doctors uh, offices that were devoted to the medical needs of the community. And that was very much in an explicit way, like they were advertising in the weekly periodicals and things like that. Um, so a smaller number, just 44 locations out of the 429, and about 30% are already listed on the National Register. Um, so again, you're seeing, you know, the same kind of clusters in downtown and then sort of uptown in the broader pool area. One example of this is the second Damien Center um, in the Holy Cross neighborhood, which is the largest HIV AIDS service organization in Indiana and just a gorgeous building. Another theme is businesses. Uh, so we define this as retail, bookstores, you know, niche interest, uh, salons, things like that, either owned by LGBTQ entrepreneurs or directly advertising to the LGBTQ community. And again, that was through documentation in all of the local periodicals and magazines. Um, so this is the biggest category, I believe, with 189 locations, um, of which 24% are listed on the National Register, um, but we have 13% that have already been demolished. Um, but you see a pretty, pretty wide uh, display, you know, again, downtown and the north side, a little bit more represented. And one of my favorite examples of this, um, at one point, the building that some of you might know is the Jazz Kitchen and Yats used to be the Modern Times Bookstore and Cyber Cafe, which would have been, you know, at the early days of the internet, um, a place to get information that you may not have seen in other places, you know, a place um, to sort of learn about how you talk about um, different types of orientation and identity. If you, if you don't know the language to talk about it, like how do you know how to find it? So places like these bookstores and cyber cafes were really important to the community. Another theme is leisure. And we defined leisure as entertainment venues or like alcohol serving establishments. Um, I didn't wanna just call it bars, uh, but these were places that um, typically it's going to be bars and drag performance halls. Um, so that's why you definitely see more of a concentration, I think, in Center Township. Um, and we had 88 locations, 36% of which are already listed on the National Register. So one of my favorite examples of this is the Ritz Theater, um, which some of you may know on 34th and Illinois. Um, at one point, it was called the Famous Door. 
and is one of the venues that's part of the sort of the earliest documented contemporary version of drag um, that we have in the city. And uh, I think we've lost the north side of this building since I've been out to document it, but it still has its charm. Another category was residences. Um, there were 26 locations for this. Uh, this was, uh, you know, just any, any individual that listed their home perhaps for a meeting or uh, a party or something more celebratory at home um, that was documented in the local periodicals. Um, so again, you're seeing that sort of center township, downtown, Broad Ripple cluster, um, but surprisingly, 58% are already listed in the National Register, um, all in different historic neighborhood nominations. Um, one of my favorite examples is the Riley Towers, um, which we were going to have 11 towers, but we've ended up with just two towers and one sort of mid-rise. Um, but this was a popular residence and a, a site of early pride fests and uh, political organizing. And you know, it's, it's the tallest um, residential tower we had until 360 Tower. You know, it has its own um, merits for sort of mid-century modern architecture and really changing our downtown skyline. But it also shares this interesting LGBTQ history as well. Um, and the last category is events. Um, so this had to do with sort of your annual LGBTQ related events and celebrations, uh, important speeches, um, but we also wanted to document the assaults and harassment and homicides that are heavily covered in the newspapers, um, just to sort of understand that side of things. Um, it's important to, when we're thinking about sort of marginalized communities and how they advocate for themselves and what that looks like um, with police and, and crime. Uh, so that's all noted in the events locations. Um, so we have 118. Again, you're seeing the common trend of sort of center township, very concentrated downtown, and sort of as you're heading north in sort of that central corridor of you know, probably Illinois Street to about College Avenue, and it sort of um, spreads out when you get into the Broad Ripple and Meridian Hills area. So here's an example for events. Um, a lot of the events happen at Monument Circle. You know, there's a lot of marches and protests. The first official pride is on the circle. Um, it's also a place of police harassment and a cruising site that gets a lot of coverage in the local papers. So where do we go from the survey that we completed four years ago? Um, there's a lot of sites that are eligible to be on the National Register that could receive local protections through IHPC. There are sites that weren't, you know, eligible 20, 30, 40 years ago when they were pursuing a National Register nomination because they were too young, but now they are certainly over the 50 year mark. Um, they could be considered if there was an, an amendment or an update. Uh, so we went through and we sort of ranked properties on a three tiered system and we were considering the integrity in both the historical and architectural significance. And what I mean by that is, if you have like a 1930s commercial building uh, with low architectural significance, uh, maybe it was used by an organization, maybe they rented it as an office for like a year or two, you know, that would probably be a, th a third tier kind of property. But if you have a building with high architectural significance that maybe an organization in the community used for decades, that, that would probably be a second tier or first tier kind of a, a judgment call there, but just a sort of triage um, for the future where we spend our efforts and time. So on this slide, I also have a list of eligible sites that are sort of my wish list. Like if I could be the benevolent dictator of preservation, these are the first sites I would probably look at protecting in some capacity. Um, so if anyone out there wants more information, feel free to contact me about those. I think it's important to talk about all the demolitions that have occurred 
um, since and even the closures. I mean, just when we started this survey, I think we've already had five gay bars close in town. And I watched buildings get demolished that I was researching and surveying one week, and then I would go back and they were gone. Um, so this is probably the most shocking example, which is the Bellflower Clinic uh, that was on West 10th Street. It's this beautiful Art Deco structure. And uh, it had been one of the first real STD clinics to directly advertise to the LGBT community. And it was demolished in 2014 um, when Eskenazi and all the, the hospitals were sort of shifting spaces and, and building new structures. Um, but I mean, just sort of the, the stonework and, and details alone, it was, it was sad to see this one go. But integrity is another issue as well. Um, you know, what, what happens when a building um, really shutters their windows for 50 years? Does that become part of the historic integrity of the building? You know, there's no standard guidelines really yet. It's, it's sort of on a case-by-case -case basis what integrity looks like when it comes to these queer structures. Um, and it's something that I think about um, because a, you know, a textbook sort of preservation explanation 10 years ago would be, you know, you take those covers off and you bring the front commercial facade back to its former glory. You know, you bring in big windows, um, but what does that mean if we lose part of that tangible integrity for when it was a queer space. Um, there's no there's no right answer yet, but it's just something I think about. And a really good example of this, um, this slide is the varsity on Penn, but I think this is probably the most shocking example. Uh, so this was the 10, this was the ruins. Um, it was a really popular lesbian bar and dance club. And uh, on the top, you can see what it looked like when it was a dance club. So you actually entered in the back and these, the front facade on Penn was all boarded up and then the building changed hands and they um, kind of changed it back to what it was, which was five historic storefronts. Um, since this picture, it's actually been monkeyed with again. Um, if you drive by, I think it's now just three storefronts. Uh, so, you know, first of all, the hardcore preservation nerd in me is kind of flustered with the painted uh, beautiful tiles. But beyond that, um, how do we sort of grapple with the loss of integrity, but um, bringing things back to maybe their, the first iteration of the structure? You know, what, what does that look like in terms of, um, you know, is photo documentation enough? Um, should we, I, I don't know what the answer is yet. So what are the next stages for the survey? Um, obviously more research to be done. Um, we have so many new materials that have come into the archive that I could spend probably a year or two updating um, with new citations and more, more locations, doing more, more work with that. Um, obviously we could be looking at more national register nomination amendments or possibly, you know, do we need an outright thematic nomination for queer spaces in Indianapolis. Um, we could take individual structures and, and sort of target protective methods with easements and covenants. Um, there's plenty of different opportunities to work with institutions in town and sort of promote these sites and structures. So I'm gonna pivot to the Indiana Historical Society's um, LGBTQ Collecting Initiative, which was started in 2014. And that was a, you know, they're sort of filling in the gaps of the archive and how do we tell a more inclusive story. And at this point, there are at least 30 robust um, collections that you can view in the archive. There's probably about 150 oral histories. Um, the collection's growing every week. Um, here are some images. One is of some drag queen performers at the famous store, and then the other is a flyer for the Rally for Decency, um, sort of a counter-protest to the Anita Bryant talk. 
at the Coliseum, which is largely considered one of the first um, events where the local LGBT community comes together to organize. Here's some more of my favorite images, some ephemera from the collection. Um, we have a flyer from Nurse Safe Sex. Uh, we also have a lot of cartoons and multiple interviews with Nurse Safe Sex, um, who was a, a character that helped to promote safe sex in town. And then on the right, um, you can see a poster for a Pride Celebration at Monument Circle. We also have been digitizing items from the collection. Um, so this is just a screenshot of, of one part of the collection to give you a better idea of everything that it offers. So you can see photo documentation, oral history, interview, um, one of the Nurse Safe Sex cartoons, some flyers. So at the end, I'll send you the link to the digital collection. I'm really excited about the Indiana Youth Group materials that are coming our way. Uh, photo credit for the black and white one um, goes out to Victoria Kensington. Um, but this collection tells about more young stories and sort of bringing um, a more inclusive lens into what young people experience in central Indiana. Another collection I've been working on that I'm really excited about is Low Pones Crashing Through the Front Door, um, which was a, it's a monthly drag queer performance um, event that has, you know, been on hold with COVID, but they also have a book and had an exhibit and actively document the local drag scene. Uh, so their photo documentation is slowly being added to our digital collection as well. So what's next for me in the archive? Um, obviously making the collections more intersectional and inclusive, um, thinking about how we collect, um, how I do outreach and engagement, things like this. Um, also reaching out to younger audiences is really important to me. You know, we're, we're making history now. It's uh, kind of hard to think about when you're in the moment, but even the, the protests and, um, events in the last few months, you know, we've had a lot of uh, queers for racial justice and different meetings and events that truly these are moments that we should be capturing so that in 50 years when historians and scholars look back, they can see um, what, we, what we were up to, what kind of efforts we were making. Um, but specifically, I'm definitely sort of looking on the pulse for more collections related to trans, bisexual, and uh, non-binary materials. Um, you know, not all drag is trans, not all trans is drag, and like we're, we're really good at collecting drag history, but I want to get at more um, trans stories. When we look at bisexuality, um, it sort of is implied or erased in the archives, um, whether that is more of a, of a gay um, periodical or a lesbian periodical. I think bisexuality gets implied a lot. Um, so how do we sort of look at where the gaps are in just, you know, specifically for bisexuals? Um, and then obviously um, getting more into gender orientation and um, things like gender queer and non-binary, you know, it's, it is International Non-Binary Day. So, um, and we didn't plan that when we were planning this event, but thinking about sort of all of these other um, forms of gender expression and like how do we best capture them and what's the appropriate way to do that is definitely on my mind. And then um, helping the Preservation Commission and their volunteer researchers with these materials, just getting them access to these materials for their project, which Meg will go into in further detail. So what's next for architecture? Um, this is something that I don't usually talk about, but since we have some architects on the line, I thought I would just throw some things out there and then walk away. Um, so what are, what's next for design and planning spaces to be more inclusive? You know, how do we redesign in this post-gender space, in this post-gender world? Um, so obviously I think the first step is more, uh, more professionals that have inclusive backgrounds and how do we sort of engage in these other 
marginalized communities to have a more fair and equitable profession. Um, and then beyond that, how do we sort of design different housing typologies for different types of families and different types of living situations? You know, the single family house for the nuclear family unit is not going to be uh, ideal for everyone. Um, but also thinking about housing affordability and access in a wider sense. Um, you know, we know that people who identify as bisexual or lesbian tend to be paid less. So how do we um, give them affordable housing options? Also thinking about commercial corridor development. You know, we, we hear a lot about transit-oriented development and ETOD and also the safe streets movement. You know, how do we make these more inclusive for everyone? Um, I think gender neutral restrooms and facilities will always be a hot topic and also um, homelessness and housing. You know, we hear it a lot for youth and also for um, senior citizens. So just thinking about all of these topics as we move forward. And I think, um, I think looking at sort of the scholarship and what we've done with the survey and all of the collections that are available, I think there's an opportunity there for architects and planners and designers to see how the queer community has altered and adapted space in the past to better design for the future. Um, so here's some links and you can get these in uh, the follow-up email that will go out um, later this week. Uh, but I did provide the link for the survey data. You can click around on an interactive map just to see different sites. Um, I also included links to our collecting initiative and our digital collection. And then uh, one of our most impressive and robust collections is the C Chris Gonzalez Indie Pride materials, which I've included the collection link. So you can at least see what is contained in the collection. And then um, I don't know if you know this, but we actually have the AIA Indiana slash Society of Architects materials um, at the Historical Society. And those papers run from 1911 to 1990. So anyone in AIA, if you want to see some of your old, um, old board meeting notes or roster lists or um, things like that, we have a great collection. Um, so I've included that collection guide link as well. And then at the end of the slide is my email and my Twitter handle. So feel free to contact me if you have any additional questions or specific questions about properties we talked about tonight. And that's what I've got. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I do think there's a couple of questions that we'll wait for the Q&A so that we can continue the conversation with Meg. Hello, everybody. Thank you for letting me speak with you this evening. And if you give me just a moment here, I'm going to share my screen also. And can we see that? All right. Yep. So real quickly, I wanted to just give a quick overview about the Indianapolis Historic Preservation Commission, because I never assume that everyone knows who we are. Um, so real briefly, we, I just wanted to touch on, let's see if I can advance the screen here. So the IHPC is a nine member commission formed under state statute and we've been around since 1967. Uh, I personally am staff to the commission and the commissioners are unpaid appointees and they're appointed by the mayor and the city county council. Uh, the commission, uh, just like you would probably assume, was established to protect arch architecturally and historically significant areas and that is throughout all of Marion County. Um, the, we, do def we do function as a division of the Department of Metropolitan Development and uh, we are located in that polarizing building that Jordan was referring to earlier on the 18th floor. So feel free to, after COVID, feel free to come by and say hello. So because we're having a conversation with the Historical Society this evening, I wanted to just kind of touch on a few organizations that people think we are, but we are not. So the Historical Society, uh, Indiana Landmark, 
Berks, we are not them. Uh, we are not the Neighborhood Association and we are not the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, like I said, we, are, we function as a division of Department of Metropolitan Development. And you, interestingly enough, even though we are part of city government, we actually function under state law as opposed to a local ordinance. So we're pretty busy at our office. We have 17 districts throughout Marion County and we also have 13 individual sites working on a few additions to that list. Um, so some of you may be familiar with areas like Heron Morton Place and the Old North Side and Lockerbie Square. Uh, Woodruff Place and Irvington are also on the list among many, many more. So a real quick map of Marion County, you can kind of see the districts are fairly concentrated in the city center, but they do scatter out even as far as 71st and Georgetown, which is the New Augusta historic area. Uh, on the east side, which I think is maybe falling off this map, is Cumberland, which is all the way out to almost the county line. So under state law, it gives our commission the power to protect local historic areas and the each district when it is designated has a historic area plan that is adopted with that designation and this is just a snapshot of Irvington's historic area plan and this is what we actually use in our office to review projects that are in our historic areas and the guidelines in these plans kind of give us some direction on what we should be looking for when we're reviewing scopes of work and of course we can do some reviews in-house and other reviews will go to a hearing officer or to the commission which the commission meets once a month and that is a public hearing for anyone to participate in. And again, what's required, and if you remember me saying it is required by state law, the requirement does actually require for you to obtain a certificate of appropriateness, which is sort of like our version of a permit. It is not a permit, but it is the certificate that gives you the right to move forward to the permit level and obtain permits once you've gotten the certificate. And this is just a screenshot of what a typical certificate of appropriateness looks like. So if you're working on a project, make sure your client does have a certificate of appropriateness before they proceed doing work. So as Jordan so eloquently started off describing, the IHPC is, like, like I told you before, it's been around for a long time and we're sort of at this point where we're looking to update the 17 historic area plans that we currently have adopted. And some of those plans have never been updated. So for example, we have the Old North Side Historic Area Plan, which dates back to 1978. Uh, it was done on a typewriter and it is not word searchable. So we want to make some changes to the plans to make them more user friendly, but also to make them, you know, really have provide a more unique user experience to anyone that is using them. Um, so in 2019, we launched the Preserve India Initiative and it's part of that large scale multi-year refresh, as I call it, the IHPC rebranded to market this. And you'll see on the right there, the logo that we've taken on with uh, the famous Union Station in there. So again, once we get these updated, which it's gonna be about a four to five year project, the plan is to include interactive story maps and the plans will be searchable. We'll also have some mapping tools uh, to go along with the updates to the guidelines to really make that user experience better and also just make it more available. So we'll start off by doing some planning and then we're actually in phase one right now. And our preservation planner is working with a citizens advisory group uh, for input on the plans and then we are in the phase right now where we're actually starting to put together the what we call the common plan which is essentially all of the 
common guidelines that are throughout all of the plans and putting them into one document. Uh, we think that that's going to make it easier for the public to use and also make it easier for the commission to update moving forward. So as part of the Preserve Indy Initiative, we started to have a conversation um, specifically with Jordan and some others who brought to our attention that there was a the survey that was done by Indiana Landmarks in 2016. In those conversations, we, we kind of created an ad hoc committee that consisted of Landmarks, the SHPO, IEPUI, uh, our office, and IHS. And we started to really sit and think about, you know, what can we do with this survey? What, what could the IHPC in particular do to really shine a light on the survey and make the history that was discovered through that survey um, part of a more solid plan. And we quickly realized that 104 of the properties that were in that survey were already under the jurisdiction of the IHPC. And what was so great about that is the properties that have the LGBTQ significance would allow for us to take that survey and put that in with the updates that we were doing as part of the Preserve Indy Initiative. So the timing of this was actually really fantastic. And so we decided that we were going to try to go back over the survey and dust it off a little bit and have some volunteers really go back and study each one of those uh, properties that were identified that were already locally protected and make sure that we have all the information correct and try to solidify that in a document that is the uh, historic area plans that I showed you earlier. And one of the nice things about that is the plans are really a document that is enforceable uh, by the commission under state law. So it really affords the protection to these very important LGBTQ historic sites that they deserve. So that process was quite the wild ride, I'm sure Jordan will admit to. Um, when we set off to do this, we didn't realize that it was the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots. And it also happened to be Pride Month. And so we quickly realized that there was a lot of people really interested in what this initiative was all about. So the City County Council was a fantastic partner with the IHPC and the entire committee. Um, Vice President Adamson and the rest of the City County Council uh, adopted a proclamation on June 3rd of 2019, officially recognizing the importance that the LGBTQ community has within the city and also the importance of recognizing the history and documenting that and making that part of a, uh, a layer, of, afford it the layer of protection that it deserves and, um, and the recognition. And just shortly after that, on June 5th, the IHPC adopted a resolution and in that resolution, it recognized the importance of the LGBTQ history and also was a resolution showing the commitment and dedication that we are going to have moving forward and ultimately the promise that we've made to make sure that those properties are uh, memorialized in a document that is legally binding. And then Shortly after that, we were able to participate in the Indie Pride Festival, just making that announcement. And here you can see Jordan and I and Councillor Adamson there on the stage. So shortly after this was released, there was quite a bit of press coverage about this. And I think that we, from this, we really learned the importance of the LGBTQ community and the history and contributions that the LGBTQ community, community has contributed. Um, we also quickly realized that there were so many people that were really interested in hearing what good might come of this. So 
uh, it was very reassuring that the work that we were getting ready to do was going to be a positive one. So you're probably very familiar with some of these sites that are in our districts already and Jordan touched on the Talbot Theater earlier. This is happens to be a historic photo of the Talbot Theater, but as she shared with you there, this is the site of some uh, pretty uh, famous drag shows that took place in this location. Uh, it did close its doors in 2016, like Jordan mentioned, um, but we do uh, want to make sure that this property is uh, protected for future generations to learn about the history of the site um, and also see that something new is done with the building moving forward while also honoring the past history. So some businesses in our districts, there's, like Jordan mentioned, there's quite a few uh, businesses within our districts that are already protected, but here's just a couple. Uh, the 501 Tavern, which also closed its doors not too long ago, is uh, you can see in the bottom right here. And uh, Greg's, which is in the top left, the, that property is located in the Old North Side. Um, and the 501 Tavern is actually in the Lockerbie Square historic area. So this property, not everybody is familiar with. This is actually located in Heron Morton Place. And I threw this one in because it's a good example of an organization. Uh, it's a faith-based organization. It's the Quaker Meeting House on Talbot Street. And the interesting thing about this property is it has existed in a residential neighborhood with very little interruption. There's um, a a very peaceful coexistence with, of this building within the residential area. Um, if you're familiar with the Quakers, uh, there, there is a, a long-standing um, acceptance of the LGBTQ community uh, dating back to probably around the 1980s. There were, you know, non-legal uh, marriages that were taking place in, in that property. Um, and really just an overall acceptance of the LGBTQ community uh, within the faith-based organization. And they've been a, a long-standing property and organization in the district for, for many, many years. So before we move on, I just wanted to, since we're talking about culturally significant areas, we obviously this year we're gonna be focusing on this initiative with the LGBTQ LGBTQ community and historic sites, but I, I wanted to also touch on, uh, especially in light of recent events, that the there are some existing culturally significant areas that are already designated. And if you're not familiar with these areas, you should be because they're very interesting. The history to them is important to the true story um, of Indianapolis. And there there has already been an initiative to protect them. And the first one is um, Ransom Place, which actually is in the top photo, you can see a home there from that neighborhood. Um, and if anybody is familiar with Madam CJ Walker, uh, you might be familiar with her attorney who is Freeman Ransom, who actually lived in Ransom Place and hence the name of the neighborhood. Uh, Ransom Place was designated in 1998 uh, it's a historically significant area, uh, predominantly black neighborhood historically, and the homes there are, are really fantastic, uh, high concentration of intact structures. And the second area is one that's a little lesser known and was actually designated quite a while ago in 1987, and that's Lockfield Gardens. And that is in the bottom photo, and that's actually a uh, housing project that was the first federally funded housing project in Indiana, Indianapolis and dates back to 1935 and that's actually still an apartment complex over by IEPUI and um, the commission like I said adopted that district designated that district in 1987 and so kind of continuing that theme our staff is working with Flanner House Homes, and if you're not familiar with that area, it's over by 16th and Dr. Martin Luther King. And Flanner House actually reached out to our staff 
and they are concerned about demolition occurring in their neighborhood and reached out to us to see you know what can they do to try to protect their historic area uh, flanner house is a more contemporary historic area dates back to the 1950s it is a historically black neighborhood um, the interesting thing about flanner house is that the Homes were built by what we call sweat equity uh, in exchange for a little bit lower price on the homes and better access to FHA loans, but many of the homeowners are still living there. And I think there is a, uh, an appreciation for the history of that area and they, they wanna make sure that that is protected for future generations. So we're continuing to have conversations with them and hopefully we'll see that that's designated here in the near future. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Um, so now we have reached our Q&A portion. Um, it looks like Jordan was attentively answering some questions while Meg was presenting, uh, but I just wanna follow up for the benefit of everyone. Um, Jordan, the, the question was specifically about the the writs and how you preserve uh, those kind of buildings. But I'm wondering if you both can talk about what it typically looks like um, for some of these spaces to be preserved, what the process looks like, um, what the importance of it is, um, and everything in between. Do you want me to go first? Sure. Okay. Um, well, I think the, the elephant in the room is that theaters are super hard to find funding to preserve. You know, they're, they're big spaces. Um, they can't always be adaptively reused. It takes a lot of money to do a facade renovation. Um, look at the Rivoli Theater on the east side. Like, we, we struggle with these structures for so long. Um, I do think you know, part of Talbot Street is a good case study in how you can adaptively reuse. Uh, if you look at the northern portion of that building, um, you have the milkshake bar babies now in there. So um, the side where you would go in for the drag performances, so not the like dance hall side, um, but that space is now a restaurant. And how how can we sort of creatively adaptively reuse these spaces um, that has to sort of be on the table to to get the funding and I know that it's going to be even harder with everything with COVID and everyone's limited resources. Um, have you Meg had any conversations with anyone about the Ritz? I remember Landmarks was looking into it and and since then both of the non-historic one-story wings have been demolished which were you know they weren't structurally sound like they probably needed to go um so now it's just the the original historic part of the structure that's still extant at this point so the ihpc has not had any interaction with anybody specifically about the roots um i think i can speak for just a second on the preservation of theaters in general and i think jordan touched on that with her comment about funding Theaters are, I mean, you can research historic theaters across the country and I mean, there's organizations nationwide that are, are really pining for the preservation of these buildings because they are so significant, but everybody is kind of up against the same issue with number one, you know, where does the funding come from? Number two, how do you adaptively reuse a theater if it's not a theater? Um, they're, they're very unusual spaces to adaptively reuse. Uh, they do not have flat floors. They typically are very open and cavernous, making them difficult to divide without drastically altering the character of the structure. Um, they, they typically, by the time they become candidates for preservation, they are in an advanced state of disrepair and you know the list kind of goes on and on the 
they're, they're, you know, having said all that, there clearly are some fantastic examples of theaters that are preserved. And I, and I do think there is hope for the Talbot Theater. The Talbot Theater is, is actually quite small in the grand scheme of theaters. So I think that it is actually very doable. It's also in a, an area that an investor can probably see, can recoup the costs, if you will, to, to reuse that space. Whereas in some cases, theaters are in small communities, um, oftentimes rather rural areas that really just cannot justify the cost to restore these buildings for the market that they're in. So fingers crossed, we're gonna see some you know, activity on the Talbot Theater specifically, but um, those are just a couple of the challenges that we see with, with those types of buildings. Thank you for that. Um, Jordan, there was a question specific to you about if you have any information about the Abbey on Mass Ave, um, which is where 45 degrees is now. Yeah, it's in the survey. And then um, in a more recent time, we received a loan for digitization collection from the Department of Metropolitan Development, which includes a lot of downtown right before um, preservation efforts or demolition and revitalization efforts. So I'm, I've been going through sort of step by step. There's a lot of Mass Ave and I think I can add some photo documentation to this, not just, you know, it's mentioned in a newspaper article or it's mentioned in a, in a magazine, but I think I'm, I'm pretty close to getting some um, photos prior to the fire included as well. Great. Um, the other question, perhaps for the both of you, you may or may not be able to speak to it, but is there much work being done with 3D scanning some of these histo historic spaces that can't be saved before they are demolished? I don't know if either, so I'll, I'll chime in from an architect's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, it costs money. And so you have to have a benefactor. I would assume that's what you guys would say. Um, there has to be someone willing to foot the bill to do that kind of um, laser scanning process if it's in a position where it's going to be demolished, um, which on the IHS end would likely look like a grant or some sort of donation. Um, I don't know that IHPC would get involved in that uh, at all uh, because they're looking at preservation and um, and renovation processes. So, um, but that would be my take as an architect on that. I don't know if the IHS has done any inter interaction with laser um, scan processes. Not in-house, but we have collaborated with the IUPUI um, University Library on the Bethel AME Church off of uh, West Street downtown. Okay. Um, so that was all technology from IUPY. Um, but if you, if you were to search or maybe Callie can find something really quick and put it in the chat, um, some sort of PR link about that project. Um, so IUPY has some really great 3D modeling imaging tech um, experts over there. And they were able to do that prior to the uh, plan to convert the church into a hotel. Um, so, you know, we were more of the repository for all of the archival, you know, materials that were at the church um, and sort of adding historic context to make sense of the scan. Um, so I haven't done any of the 3D scanning stuff myself, mm -hmm. um, but I also think that there are people at Ball State that probably work on that and um, when you start to get into more of the archaeology and cemetery side of things that's when you see a lot of um, the sort of 3D modeling technology being used. Mm -hmm. I mean I think uh, another option there too would be um, especially if you know that it's going to be demolished or, or renovated um, similar to how um, bottle works is occurring um, if you know that laser scan process is going in 
if the firm is attentive um, and understanding to that fact, they're going to likely be doing some sort of existing drawing process, which, which does exist. It may or may not be laser scanning. So you do have some preservation of what was there originally. Um, it's just whether how public it is. Um, so there was a there was a comment, Meg, um, which I will kind of gently turn into a question. Um, the the future plans for updating the neighborhood plans uh, as it relates to IHPC and the preserve indie process. Um, are looking for a diversity of infrastructure. And sometimes the best way to speak to that too is a diversity of voice. And um, while some of this can happen through the volunteering uh, of helping IHPC with those updates and with that research, as you mentioned, um, sometimes it's also the people who have the final decision on what happens. Uh, and you mentioned that the commission is uh, an appointment process. So if there are people who would like to lend their diverse voice to this, uh, what does getting on the commission look like? That, that's a great question and thank you for bringing that up. Um, it, for those who know me personally, this has been a personal mission of mine since I took this position in 2018 uh, as administrator. And, you know, I, I think the, to be transparent, the, the, our commission currently is made up of all white commissioners. And the question is brought up oftentimes of, you know, how can you effectively have a conversation about diversity and have an audience that is made up of diverse people when the commission that is representing them doesn't look like them. Um, the city county council and the mayor's office are ultimately responsible for the appointments that are on our commission. Um, I, I can definitely share with you that I have made it very clear that it is my desire to make sure that future appointments um, when they are considering candidates that they identify a candidate who's clearly a person who is qualified to be on the commission, but also someone who um, is someone who is representative of a diverse population that's made up of our districts. Uh, specifically, there are no black people on our commission. There have been in the past, uh, but it is definitely an area where we fall short and that we need to make sure that we are improving on. And so uh, I know for, for myself, that's a commitment I have made. And I, I know that we have leadership on the council and the mayor's office that also would uh, echo those sentiments. So I, I do believe that that is something that we will hope to see improved here in with some of our next appointments. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, the commission itself is to just follow up on this uh, is a um, set amount of people. So you have to wait for someone to roll off or retire or whatever have you, correct? And then is there a call for interest or how does that process work? That's a great question. So each commissioner serves a term of three years and there are nine commissioners and there are um, five commissioners that are appointed by the city county council and four by the mayor's office. They, those positions, those seats rather are, they do rotate. So we don't lose everyone on the same year, of course. Um, but ultimately the mayor's office has what we call the um, office of constituent services and they are responsible for appointments. And then uh, the city county council is, uh, the, pro the way the process works there is that we a counselor uh, does call up a, a potential candidate and that is ultimately decided upon uh, with the 
with a vote from the city county council. And so, you know, like with all issues with the city county council, the public obviously can voice their opinion on, on that, but that is what the process looks like. And this year, I think we have two seats at the end of this year and the next year we have four seats up in 2021. Okay. So, and those seats are through the mayor's council, so there's a, some sort of application process. There, there is not an application process per se. The, these, the way these appointments are, are done are done internally. And I just know that the, the mayor's office has a specific position that is dedicated to boards and commissions. And that's, that's how that process works. And then of course the council, that's a very public process, but there, you know, that's ultimately a decision that the council makes that we really don't get too involved in, but that's, um, you know, if people did have thoughts on that, they can certainly voice their opinion to the council if they wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. um, Jordan, you've done a lot of research and collection as it relates to the buildings and uh, whether they are standing or not. Um, we, we understand the kind of intangible value that they bring. Um, does the IHS have any research that speaks to the kind of statistical value that that kind of diverse function brings to a community? Yeah, sort of in tandem with Blade's comment on here as well. Um, I, I would actually say we don't have a lot on the buildings. You know, it's more about the people and their stories. Um, I sort of have to like go in as a detective to sort of hunt down the locational data to make, to make it make sense in sort of an architectural history standpoint. It's, it's very much our archive is about people's stories through oral histories and telling of their memories and then documentation like event flyers and photo albums and video footage. Um, so there's definitely a, it's really hard to sort of give that a, a numerical value, but I will say that we have so much, so much media requests about this material compared, like I, I get probably more activity from the media on these collections than, than anything else I work with on a regular basis in the archive. Um, we have a lot of descendants and relatives who want to learn more about, you know, their, their uncle that they know performed downtown. Um, so I, I help people sort of untangle those mysteries. I've, you know, some of the, the history and scholarship I've done on police harassment of LGBTQ members has led to me talking to um, family members of victims and it kind of becomes a, you know, there's like an emotional aspect to that of, um, I never, you know, sought out to, to do that when I started this work, um, but there's, it's very much an emotional thing when you're talking about marginalized communities and identities and, and seeing actually represented in the archive for like the first time for some of us. Um, so yeah, it's sort of hard to like quantify it, but um, definitely more about people and, and their feelings and, and their fight for equality is, is really the main theme of, of those collections in our archive. So kind of the inverse of that, Meg, um, the there's we we know that there's inherent value to um, not having missing teeth in a block or having a preservation of continuity and context. Um, but there's also a stigma of a uh, uh, historically protected neighborhood being more expensive or um, a historically protected neighborhood being harder to renovate and serve a future current community uh, in a different way than was done previously. Um, can you speak to anything that you have seen in your, your um, years at the IHPC as to what that looks like in reality? Sure. And so I didn't touch on this because we just didn't get real deep into what the preservation plans are, but the, the IHPC actually has two different types of historic areas. Uh, 
designation categories, if you will. So there is a traditional historic district and there's also what we call a conservation district. Some conservation districts um, that you might be familiar with are Ransom Place, which we talked about earlier, uh, New Augusta up in Pike Township and Cumberland and Cottage Home. Uh, Cumberland is our furthest east district. Um, it's also a, an area where the median income in Cumberland is significantly lower than it is in Center Township. When the district was designated, they, they saw the need for the designation to occur, but they wanted to make sure that in doing that, it didn't require homeowners to have to pay large amounts of money to meet the standards in the plan. And so, and that's the premise behind a conservation district is that the guidelines are flexible. Uh, they are only what the neighborhood wants to include in the plan. So in other words, if it isn't covered in the plan, then we don't review it. Um, and it allows things like vinyl siding, which I know sometimes comes as a shock to people that we would allow vinyl siding on a historic house. But the reality is the vinyl siding is, for all intent and purposes, is fairly harmless to a building. It could be easily removed, um, but it, it, it's a way for a homeowner to, you know, not break the bank when they are living in a property that requires maintenance. Um, but also achieves the goal of leaving the structure intact so that, you know, maybe someday somebody can take the vinyl siding off and they can restore the siding underneath. So it, it, it really is a, a mechanism for people to really achieve the goals that we're set out to do uh, while also making it fairly affordable. Um, Cottage Home, their plan is a little different in, in that it's I call it almost like a hybrid between the two different types of districts. But again, there's things that we don't review at all, like on the backs of buildings. Sometimes in those plans, those things are off limits for us to review. Um, the, the other element to this is that there's a list of things in our fee schedule that don't actually require a fee to review. Um, so there, there's an element to that as well. And our hope is we, the commission, last year approved the use of some funds that we had to apply towards a roof stabilization program. And that program is gonna be designed to assist homeowners that really need to do that work. Uh, we all know the roof is ultimately what protects the, and preserves the structure anyway. So we're, our hope is to have enough money in that fund so that we can help a couple homeowners a year to replace the roof and you know keep the building sealed up for the long-term preservation of the building. Do you see um, much gentrification occurring in the process of creating uh, preservation or conservation districts? Yeah, we get, as you can imagine, we get that question a lot and it, it's a really difficult question to answer. And I say that because the preservation of our historic areas occurred over such a long period of time. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that IHPC districts, some of them like Lockerbie Square dates back to 1967. And if you saw Lockerbie Square when it was designated, um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the Lockerbie we all know today, that's for sure. Uh, and most of our districts were like that. And I think there's an element of just, it, it's hard to even put into words. I think you really have to look at just how the district evolved over time. Um, you know, in some cases we saw, you know, what, what appears to be gentrification when in reality, we, we lost entire generations of people. Heron Morton's a really good example of that. Um, Heron Morton also had, uh, out of all of our districts, the most vacant lots in all of our historic areas combined. And so it, it appears to some that what you're seeing is gentrification, when in reality, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's actually what you're looking at. 
Now, having said that, there are definitely historic areas that beyond a doubt are gentrified. Um, Fountain Square is a good example, I think, um, where it, it really was a whole generation of people displaced uh, in, in a fairly short period of time. Um, and you know whether that's related to historic preservation or not, I'm not sure. Uh, but I do think that preservationists own a piece of that. Uh, but collectively over the years, I just don't know if gentrification is exactly the right word to use in some in some cases, uh, not all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's we're we're kind of starting to to blend issues, right? Because a lot of this is zoning issues, which IHPC nor IHS oversee. Um, Old North Side, I would say, would be a, a similar example of a complete displacement of uh, a generation of people. Um, but that also speaks to kind of some of, not necessarily redlining, because Old North Side was um, slumlords that then sold up and pushed out um, renters. Um, now, having said that, are there are there preservation districts or conservation districts that you can think of um, that are through the process of what the neighborhood plans are trying to enact through conservation districts? I'm thinking kind of of um, maybe like Windsor Park um, that are trying to attempt a preservation while mitigating historical redlining. Yeah, that's a great question. So. And that's actually a good example because I think that Windsor Park is experiencing true gentrification right now and you know it's not even designated yet. Um, the, the issue that that I've seen in a lot of historic areas is just a lack of investment in infrastructure across the board over decades and periods of time where you know for one reason or another there is a resurgence of investment that comes into that neighborhood. Um, you know, some may say that that's triggered by the designation process uh, in other districts. It's not. Um, you know, Windsor Park and Fountain Square are good examples where there wasn't a designation to be made yet. Um, there, there are definitely, though, areas where, you know, they, they see it coming. <laughs> and they, they know that they have to act fast to try to figure out a strategy. And Windsor Park's a good example because they know that they are laser focused on trying to maintain the integrity of the population that lives there. And, um, you know, while also accepting the reality that there is going to be development there. And so it's really trying to find that balance between how do you, how do you make it a place where people can maintain their home ownership while also growing and property values increase and all those things. So uh, the, the nice thing about the designation is that, you know, we can have those conversations. We can plan ahead and make specific recommendations in the plans to do that. Uh, Heron Morton Place is actually a good example where, you know, back in 1986, I think is when they were designated they, they really saw the future much earlier than most districts do. Um, the, the vacant land that's at 16th, well, it used to be vacant land, I should say, between 16th and 17th in, in Alabama and New Jersey. Uh, I, I didn't put it in my slide presentation, but I, I oftentimes show an aerial photograph of what that area looked like over the decades. And it's, it'll, it'll really kind of blow your mind how, mm -hmm. how it has evolved. But the neighborhood, they, when that district was designated, they saw the future and they said, we need to make sure that we include that vacant land in the boundaries of the protected district because that is ultimately going to be developed and we want to make sure that we are including that so that the recommendations are reflective of what we think needs to happen there and they developed a committee during that designation 
um, and there are very specific recommendations for low income homeowners and making some concessions, if you will, when a property owner just simply cannot afford to do the things that the plan typically would recommend. Um, and you, you can see the commission has over the years heard cases where property owners really truly had a financial hardship. And, uh, you know, we always tease that we never allow vinyl, but the reality is that the commission has, they have. Um, when a homeowner has to make a decision between water coming in and their checkbook, it's, it's really a, a, a time where we need to start looking at affordable options um, and really put the preservation of the structure uh, secondary. So going through that designation process can allow for a neighborhood to have those conversations and make sure that that's included in the plans. Mm -hmm. But what you're speaking to specifically is uh, frequently single family home ownership um, and their, uh, their ability to maintain or renovate um, their property. Um, do the, the plans it, either in the current phase or in future phases take into account and then this then gets into zoning stuff. Um, do they take into account recommendations of um, different uses of the property, multifamily, affordable housing, um, caps on pricing, um, at where, or from what your research has shown and what your, or what Jordan's research has shown, um, are you making recommendations to the city council about zoning changes? Uh, because so much of gentrification, as we talked about uh, just a couple minutes ago, is is the displacement of people. It's not the improvement of an area, it's the improvement of an area that displaces those who are currently there. Um, so if, if we're talking about single family home ownership is one thing, but talking about how we continue to, while renovating a neighborhood, create space for everyone to be there uh, yeah. is something different. Yeah, great question. So um, if you're familiar with zoning, the interesting thing about the IHPC is that we, the commission actually acts as the Board of Zoning Appeals in historic districts. Um, we're, the commission's probably one of the only commissions in the country that actually has that authority. Um, and the reason we started to do that is so that we could play an active role in that and make recommendations that were consistent with what the plans were recommending. So most of our districts are actually zone D8. And if you're familiar with D8, it allows for uh, single family, two family, multifamily, um, you know, much to the chagrin of uh, some people sometimes when they find out that we can squeeze a lot of units in a building, it's, um, you know, really the, the idea behind that is to, number one, to make units affordable for people because zoning is a mechanism in which we can control that. And the other is to uh, really kind of play a role in allowing for the density of a district to be what it, it should be in an urban environment. We don't want to see all single family homes. Uh, so that a lot of these historic buildings are great because they, they were always kind of, you know, smallish units in multifamily buildings. Um, the buildings are, you know, great historic buildings and we encourage developers to maintain them as, you know, especially the apartment buildings uh, as rental units so that there is that diversity of uh, income levels and people in a district. And I think, you know, it, I know it seems like there's an awful lot of single family homes in our districts, but if you really look and study them, uh, the Old North Side in particular really has quite an inventory of uh, apartment buildings that help to offset that, uh, you know, the, the price range, if you will, for affordable units in the district. Uh, we also have quite a few properties that are owned by Merchants Affordable Housing. Uh, they bought the entire Zender suite back a few years back, and those units are in historic districts and um, are all affordable and uh, affordable units that are located within IHPC boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, 
this has been a great conversation. Jordan, do you have any final comments to add? Yeah, I would add that the different housing typologies we have in the historic districts is super important right now as we're coming to terms with a housing affordability crisis. Um, we also have a state legislator that banned inclusionary zoning um, as it was preemptively trying to ban an affordable housing plan in Bloomington, um, but what it, it really is de facto exclusionary zoning. So that makes it really hard for the city to do new types of multifamily affordable units. So these, these spaces we have in the historic districts become even more important because it's really what we have to work with that we can sort of control our own destiny. And then in the uh, chat, I did send a link out to a study that was done a few years ago from Place Economics. Um, it's a study on the impact of historic preservation districts for Indianapolis, and it sort of gets at um, these questions about gentrification and displacement, and, and it's very data heavy, but it really looks at how different practices in the market do impact neighborhoods differently. But for, for a lot of historic districts in Indianapolis, it's, it's more stable. Um, so I think that project kind of helps add some context to these questions. So check it out when you have a few hours of free time. And Jordan, will that be in the, uh, a link in the list of follow-up information, perhaps? We can send that out. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you both for your time tonight. Um, I know time right now is weird and everyone's tired of, uh, of web calls. And thank you everyone who attended today. Uh, we're going to wrap up and be mindful of everyone's time um, and let everyone go grab a bite to eat. It is now 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I know my dogs will be happy to finally see me today. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the call, as I kind of just alluded to now, we will send out a follow-up email um, with some information about how you can help volunteer for research, how you can help volunteer for the Preserve Indy process, um, and some, some links as to um, some of the topics that we covered today. Um, please consider joining future um, conversations